Hi everyone, this is Laura Smith from SLP Mommy of Apraxia, and I am beyond thrilled and over the moon and any other word that I can describe to say that I have, um, you know, renowned genetic researchers in childhood apraxia speech on a Zoom all together um, talking about what they're passionate about. They live and breathe this. They do this all day. They're very passionate people and they all have personally affected my life even though I've never actually met any of them in person. So I just wanted to give a brief background on how that is. Um, uh, I uh, read a paper in 2018, Sharon Gretz, who, used to, who is the founder of uh, Now Apraxia Kids, sent me an article from Dr. Morgan, and it was advice to pediatricians on, you know, referring for genetics, and at the time, my daughter had not gone to genetics, and I read it, and just everything about the paper said, why have I not gone to genetics? Um, so I took Ashlyn to genetics, and two months later, she had a diagnosis of BCL11A, a mutation on BCL11A that was mentioned in Dr. Morgan's paper that Sharon Gretz sent me. <laughs> so um, from there, I told Sharon, Ashlyn has this, and she said, I know the researcher who researches that. And she introduced me over email to Dr. Peter. And um, Dr. Peter was able to uh, do kind of a case. I don't know if you did a case study or definitely a poster um, with her PhD student, Laurel Bruce, on uh, BCL11A. So that's kind of how I know all of you. So I'm gonna have introductions right now. Um, I'm gonna, what makes sense on my screen is I go, you'll see it when it airs, but I go left and down and over. So the way I have it on my screen is Dr. Peter, Laurel Bruce and Dr. Morgan. So Dr. Peter, if you could go first. Hello, my name is Beata Peter. I'm an associate professor at, at Arizona State University in the College of Health Solutions. And in my lab, my lab is the speech language genetics lab, and we do uh, etiology studies of what causes, what are the genetic causes, and we also do uh, intervention studies there. Okay, thank you, Laurel. Hi, I'm Laurel Bruce. I'm a PhD student at Arizona State University in the College of Health Solutions in Dr. Peter's lab, um, which I have just really, really enjoyed. I am in my dissertation phase, and I'm working on um, the genetics of speech sound disorders and um, working with some wonderful families to, to see if we can find some uh, genetic causes for, um, for some of their issues. So, yeah. Thank you. Dr. Morgan. Thank you. Thank you for having us, Laura. Um, your passion certainly shines through, so mm -hmm. we're very grateful to be here. Um, I'm a professor of speech pathology at the University of Melbourne and also the Murdoch Children's Research Institute. And similarly, uh, we have a research lab called the Speech and Language Group. Uh, where we're really focused as well on etiology and also a lot on once we've identified um, genetic conditions associated with speech and language, then trying to do large cohort studies to really learn a little bit more about the broader spectrum um, of abilities um, of the children who have those conditions. Yes, and I can't wait to get to your paper. You have, I think, the most recent paper at the moment, and um, when it hit the presses, everyone was buzzing about it. So hopefully we'll be able to talk about your most recent paper that identified a lot more uh, genetic conditions associated with CAS. Um, Okay, thank you. So the first one, I have uh, some questions that were just sent to me from readers. Genetics, um, <laughs> even when you guys briefly spoke before I just hit record, there are some words that um, un <laughs> unfortunately I'm like, oh my goodness. Um, so I, even to take it down at a basic level than that, um, we have some questions from my readers. So. Um, the first one was, what are some red flags that um, would tip a parent or professional off to send a referral to genetics? Do you want to go? Does anyone else want to go first? Or I'm happy to... Go ahead, because you're, so, you're the paper that really got me started, so... Um, I guess, yeah, some of the, the core features at, at the moment would be uh, where a child has really had delayed milestones so where um, sort of first words were really difficult maybe feeding early feeding milestones um, later motor milestones mm -hmm. often many of the children um, as in the condition that Dr Peter has identified as well some of the children have difficulty with those fine motor and the gross motor movement skills 
Um, sometimes children might also have other challenges. So sometimes the social skills challenges or um, attention deficit issues. Um, so there's some of the um, additional sort of features that often might flag to a, a family or to a paediatrician that they might want to consider genetic testing. But uh, Laurel or Beata might have further notes to make to that. Yes. Uh, that's actually such a good question. Uh, both parents and uh, health professionals uh, tell us that they don't quite know how to pick up on the red flags and if they do pick up a red flag, what to do about it. So um, this has come up at workshops. So that's why we've uh, developed some workshops on uh, teaching parents to look for signs, either signs that, as Dr. Morgan said, that are a little bit like syndromic looking, so gross motor, fine motor involvements. Um, we've at uh, ASU, for this reason, to equip parents and health professionals, we've created an online certificate in clinical genetics for health professionals that will launch in August, this August 2020, uh, most likely, if we can. Oh, wow. And this will be um, open to healthcare professionals or, you know, anyone really wants to learn about this and we'll teach some of these practical aspects there. But yeah, I, I, uh, the only other thing that I could add is you might look for syndromic involvement. You might also uh, look for signs of some other kind of a syndrome that has speech uh, associated with it. So mm -hmm. roll that out. Is yeah. it? Uh, and I don't have too much to add, but I, I will say I worked in the schools for a number of years. And I think um, if a child came with a label of a syndrome, genetics was on my mind, but it wasn't on my mind in a lot of other cases okay. like apraxia. And so I think that's one thing that um, if, I, if I was back in the schools now, I, how I would be thinking differently after kind of learning more about the genetics is um, what, you know, of the kids that maybe are showing up with apraxia on my caseload, could there be a genetic, an underlying genetic component to that? Is it fair to say that the kids who we're seeing hit at the moment more for a genetic um, variant are kids who have more than one uh, diagnosis? I think certainly that's fair to say. And sometimes what might occur is that the children come to see us and they often will have apraxia is the primary right. condition because that's one of our inclusion criteria right and then they might also have had the movement challenges as well so they're seeing ot and physio but they won't ne necessarily have a developmental coordination disorder mm. uh, and then i guess as we go forward on our journey and do further testing sometimes we might identify other um, conditions that the child also presents with um, that might not have been written about before or, or thought about in the child's history. Or other times there might be some attention issues or um, sometimes a mild ASD feature. So many children, as we know, who have apraxia might be given that ASD diagnosis and sometimes that seems to fit. And other times maybe it's fair to say it was the best fit maybe for some kids at a certain point in the time of their life. So, um, but yes, yeah, certainly even if the children come to us and largely have the apraxia and maybe motor features. Often when you look a little bit further, there might be some other um, shared features that you identify. Yeah, I really appreciate that because before, you know, I just want to help families that come after me as well. And so Ashlyn was pretty late. She was eight getting diagnosed. And, um, you know, I was on a wild goose chase for six years. It was like, okay, she's behind in fine motor. What is this? And no one, no one knows about, if they don't know about childhood apraxia speech, they really don't know about developmental coordination disorder. Um, so it was just like, yeah, she's got motor planning of the body. I'm like, what is motor? It's got to be something. That's like when people said speech impediment it's something what is it so you know it's just this like then I get you know dyspraxia developmental coordination disorder we get a ser dystonic cerebral palsy diagnosis ADHD language disorder I mean you know just it kept adding up until you know I get that BCL 11a I pull research articles from Dr. Peter and there sat my daughter. <laughs> All of those disorders that I had been on a wild goose chase fit neatly under this, like those little letters and numbers. I was like, I wish I would have known this to begin with. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, well that leads us into, here's something I get all the time as a clinician. We have the basic 
I don't even know what it's called. There's a basic genetic test that tests for Down syndrome and Fragile X and like everybody gets this test. And because everyone gets it, parents assume they've had genetic testing. Can you guys describe what that genetic test is? I think you might be referring to a karyotype. Uh, many parents get a karyotype analysis and when their child is born. And basically it's a very gross kind of an analysis where you look at the chromosomes and you can see if there's an extra chromosome, if there's a missing chromosome, or you can also see if a big chunk of a chromosome is either missing or it's duplicate. But that's certainly not <laughs> enough to catch all of the, all of the variants. Some of the variants are teeny tiny. But having said that, you know, there is one chromosomal cause on chromosome 16, where a small deletion of a chunk of that chromosome is actually associated with CAS and it's also associated with autism spectrum disorder. That's not to say that everyone has that particular cause for CAS, but if it's there, it is noticeable. Yeah, so what did you call that again? What kind of test? Uh, that's a karyotype. Okay. And that's many, many hospitals will do that. Uh, I'm told when uh, when a newborn makes their arrival, and that's you know that's where you can check for Down syndrome, for yeah. instance, because you could just see if there's three copies of the 21st chromosome. Very easy, very simple. Or if there's only one copy of the X chromosome in a girl, then that's Turner syndrome. You can just see that very easily, but uh, that doesn't go into great depth. You need something a little bit more detailed to get at the bottom of some of these etiologies. Perfect. So when we talk about, oh, go ahead, Angela. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, yeah, I was just going to say um, the clinical geneticists I work with often talk about the fact that with the carrier type, that first test, uh, which Dr. Peters described so nicely, they're literally looking down a microscope to look at the chromosome. So it's a very gross test in a way. Whereas nowadays you have chromosomal microarray analyses, which they're still looking at chromosomes, but it's such a refined test. You can see tiny deletions or duplications of chromosomal material within each chromosome. So it's, it's like we've moved on. So the carrier type in sort of in the 80s and then moved into this very fine ability to not just detect gross things like additional chromosomes or big chunks of missing chromosomes, but very small changes um, within chromosomes or even du duplications, a little bit of extra material. So they're the sort of levels of testing. And then you get to the next level, which is looking at mapping out every single gene. So whole genome um, sequencing or mapping out certain coding bits of the gene. So e exome sequencing. Um, yeah, so they're kind of the graded levels, if you like, of testing. So am I hearing you correctly that a microarray is looking more in-depthly at chromosomes where whole exome sequencing is looking more in-depthly at the genes affecting the chromosomes? Is that, am I hearing that right? Yes, yeah. You, oh, you, okay. Yeah, so that's kind of, they're kind of the distinctions. But Dr. Pina might like to say more because I know she's got her great course, so she probably knows how to step people through that very nicely as well. Well, um, maybe we should... Um, say at this point that there is not really one panel for CAS that right. we can order. Right. Um, and so as Dr. Morgan said, you have to look at everything. If you don't know where to start, you have to like a chromosomal microarray, you will see, you know, as Dr. Morgan described, you will see if there are little pieces missing or duplicated. And that's especially in areas where there have already been cases found uh, with CAS. That's a very good probable pathology right there. So that's interesting because, you know, parents usually find themselves in, um, you know, with a genetic counselor. So they get a genetic counselor and the counselor is the one who's responsible for ordering the type of testing based on the character, the characteristics the child is presenting with. You guys call that phenotype, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the phenotype. Okay. Um, phenotype. So, yes. And so it's interesting, the clients I have who have the um, cat genetic counselor order the microarray, and the ones who go right into what they did with Ashen was a partial ID autism um, uh, uh, exome sequencing. Uh -huh. So I really, I don't understand where, you know, I, I guess as a parent and a clinician, I'm like, how are they making these decisions that we're gonna go with my, like they never did a microarray with Ashen. We went straight to this partial panel. Yeah, so often um, 
there is the clinical route. So you went through the clinical route. So um, that's fantastic that you had clinicians who had already identified that perhaps she would um, have one of the gene variants or a change or a spelling error in a gene associated with one of the conditions on that panel. So that's fantastic. They went, they felt comfortable to go straight to the panel. Um, in my lab at the moment, everything's largely research-based. So we will always just do a chromosomal microarray first, just to sort of rule out that there might be a change at that level, at the chromosomal level. Because then when we go further, it actually costs um, around a thousand US dollars at the moment for us to do the genetic sequencing of, usually we do mum, dad and the child, and we try and look at what might be different um, between mum, dad and child in terms of genetic change. So as um, Dr. Peter said, there isn't like a CAS panel, um, a, a childhood apraxia or speech panel. Um, so, and within our clinical work, so we do have a clinic, although it's stopped due to COVID, um, then we will try and have um, children um, still, we still always will do a microarray in the clinical world and then we'll go to a panel next. But you're right, the panel at the moment is still very much an ID. Um, panel even at our institute. So even though we know all of these CAS genes, what happens is somebody will do a microarray, then someone in a lab will look for all of the genes we know that are associated with apraxia just to see whether there are any deletions or duplications within those specific genes. And if not, then we go to the broader um, whole genome sequencing. And then it's like a very much a research exercise still of um, filtering out and very um, fancy genetic statistics, we yeah. would call it to try and do all of these um, various methods to see where the gene change might occur. And then there's a whole other step to see, is that gene change maybe unique to that family or has it been reported previously in, a, in association with apraxia? But Dr. Peter or Laurel might like to follow up there because that was a bit wordy. <laughs> yeah. That's great. The only other thing I might add is, um, you know, the BCL11A gene was not on the panel when we found it. In fact, it had been looked at once, this is several years ago, before it was on the landscape. And so that's just to say that, you know, someone might have a child with a practice of speech and there might be, what you know, one question was about the NOVA, there may be a sudden sporadic change in that child. And nothing will be written about that gene because it's the first of its kind. But once it's on the landscape, it's on the landscape. So, yeah, yeah, it could be like a total surprise. That's so interesting. Um, would there be any reason for someone like me to get a microarray now? For someone like you yourself? Sorry, no, I meant my daughter. <laughs> uh, it seems from what you've described that the endpoint has been reached. I don't know what the others think, but you know, you found your answer. Yeah. It seems like it, so there yeah. wouldn't be any point in doing anything further. Yeah, okay. Um, great. Awesome. Okay. So um, you just mentioned de novo, which leads us greatly, which is a nice little segue into my next question, which is a lot of people, they hear genetics and they automatically think inherited, inherited diseases, inherited causes, um, you know, and in fact, there can be something called de novo, uh, you know, occurrences, which is something Ashley has. So um, can you speak to, since you started that, Dr. Peter, can you just finish speaking between the difference between what is actually a de novo and what is a heritage? Sure. So um, Dr. Morgan will say a little bit about the Fox uh, P2 family, the KE family in London, which is a case of inherited, you know, half the people inherited. What you describe about your daughter is de novo. It is, it, it, there was no incidence of that particular change in either the mother's or the family's family line. But your daughter has it now, and it is genetic, it is de novo, and you know, further down the generations, children who have de novo changes will be able to pass those along potentially, and then they become inherited. So most mutations spring up sporadically somewhere, and then from there on out, they get inherited if um, you know, progeny does exist. That is very important what you just said, because I have a lot of adults with apraxia listening to this. And that is the one thing that I hear consistently is, should I get testing? And if I get testing and I find out that I have some type of de novo, you know, occurrence, can I pass it on to my children? So the answer you're saying is yes. 
Well, we all have de novo changes. Keep that in mind. Like every generation, we throw hundreds and hundreds of de novo little point mutations. We miss little piece of DNA. And if there's no change in the phenotype, if we're just fine, thank you, there wouldn't be any reason to go chasing after some de novo event because if it's phenotypically irrelevant, it's irrelevant if it gets inherited or not. But if it's tied to a certain phenotype like CAS, that might be a different story. Mm -hmm. Um, I totally, I was, I, I had an agenda and I deviated because <laughs> I get so excited. So um, actually, I'm going to go back. Laurel Bruce, we mentioned the uh, KE family. And can you just explain what that is for people who aren't in our world? Sure, yeah. And Dr. Morgan, feel free to jump in because I know you worked <laughs> with the KE family. Um, but yeah, the KE family is basically um, a family from the UK that's multi-generational, um, which I just found out they have a fourth generation as well that um, participated in studies in the late 90s. And my understanding was that they were referred for genetic testing by the director of the school that a lot of the children attended. Um, and half of the family members um, had apraxia, as well as some language disorder. And um, some of them also had lower IQ as well. And so they participated in genetic testing and they discovered a mutation, a genetic change on, uh, on chromosome seven. Um, in a gene that came to be known as FOXP2. And what they found was just, you know, we have a gene from our moms and our dads, and they found just a single genetic change on one of the genes. So just one letter change going from a GG to an AG. And that is, was the first time that really a genetic change was linked to uh, speech and language impairment. Yes. Wow. And since then, I feel like, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like once they found out that, you know, apraxia could have some sort of genetic component like that, that kind of really was the starting point to um, more uh, genetic discovery since. Is that accurate? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dr. Yeah. Morgan, you um, know them or were involved with them, you said. Yeah, so when I uh, moved to London in 2004 to work in Professor Faraday Varga Kaden's lab in London at University College London, and um, she and her lab were responsible for doing a lot of the phenotyping work and also early brain imaging work with the family. And at that time, I also met Professor Simon Fisher um, and Dr. Fisher um, with um, some other colleagues was responsible for identifying um, that gene change as part of some of his work in Oxford. And we still work with Simon very much now, but yes, that really launched the field. Um, although interestingly, it did take probably another decade for us to really get yeah. going. Um, and that was due to the genome sequencing now. So remember the Human Genome Project was really a hot thing that everyone talked about and that ability to map out the sort of 25,000 genes or so in our body um, and to be able to look more specifically at those genes. So once that technology became much more rapid and more affordable, then that's where we've seen the um, further gene discoveries. Yeah, wow. I feel like um, I feel like now that it's getting more, uh, it's also it was really expensive when Ashlyn was little. I feel like the cost has come down. Um, so I was more well, actually, and then I got her. It, it was a few things that allowed me to do it, but it, the cost has been prohibitive for a lot of families too. Um, I think and, that's true. Um, and some countries, you know, in the Netherlands for a long time, they've been doing exome sequencing and testing. So the Netherlands have been really. Um, very quick at identifying different conditions and, and syndromes, not necessarily in apraxia, but in, in other um, sort of intellectual disability or autism syndromes. Um, and in Australia, we just had a bill passed that within our health service, children with a mild or severe intellectual disability will be able to have free genome sort of sequencing or testing to reach a clinical diagnosis. But of course, that's not that helpful for our CAS families where many of our children don't have an intellectual um, disability or maybe just a mild learning difficulty. So it doesn't really change the landscape for us um, in that way. So many of the kids in Australia are only coming sort of through the research program and receiving diagnoses that way unless they have really skilled clinicians who, as Beata was saying before, are able to sort of pinpoint and think, well, actually, maybe they might have one of these existing known conditions and we'll test specifically for that. Yeah. Um, so we have, let me look at my, uh, we have seven more minutes. So I do want you to at least summarize your current research right now and just kind of where you see the, um, kind of where you see it headed. So 
I think I'm going to start with you, Dr. Morgan, only because we have your uh, recent paper. I have April 28th that was just published. Um, gene discovery highlights transcriptional dysregulation, and you identified a lot of different, um, I think, new uh, variants in that. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, um, thanks. I'll be trying to be brief because I feel like I Laurel and Fiat deserve more time. I've been a bit chatty. I shouldn't have had so much coffee this morning. Sorry, everybody. Um, so in the paper, yes, we identified um, nine further uh, genes that are now for the first time associated with apraxia, but most of those genes actually were already known or written about um, previously in association with other conditions. Um, and so, but it, it's helpful, uh, as we were saying before, if clinicians can think, oh, actually children with a speech challenge might have this condition. So um, many of the genes had actually been associated with intellectual disability or autism or other conditions, even one cleft palate. Um, but because we're se sequencing or studying children at the very mild end who present with speech problems and not necessarily the learning difficulties or other difficulties, because it's really more in the realm of research um, that we're, we're seeing those kids we're, if you like, expanding out the phenotypic spectrum. So it's a bit hard for our families at the moment because they might receive one of these diagnoses, but when they go to the literature, all of the children that they read about have much more severe presentations, yeah. you know, much more. Yes. And that's really hard for families because they think, my kid has a praxia, but they don't necessarily have all of these other difficulties. Mm -hmm. So what we want to really let people know about is it's, we really understand that what we're doing is showing that you can have milder symptoms and I say milder because of course we know how tough apraxia can be and how much we have to work intensively to overcome that um, but I suppose that's one of the things our paper showed that there might be existing conditions out there that really are associated with apraxia and then the second thing that was so interesting is the heterogeneity so ha like how many different genes yeah. may be explaining apraxia yeah so, Across, uh, there was a cohort study by Simon Fisher and Larry Schreiberg um, a couple of years ago, and um, in in that cohort of children, this one gene popped up, set BP1, and then in our second cohort with a few more cases, only that one gene was was found to be changed or have a have a mutation in that gene across both cohorts. All the other genetic findings were completely different for yeah. all of those children. So um, we can see it's a really exciting time. There are going to be so many more genes that we'll find that are associated with apraxia. But then it's also complex for us at the same time because it's not like we can say, okay, you've got apraxia, let's test for these 10 genes. We're right. still really on that right. journey. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. Dr. Peter, what are you up to now recently? Uh, we are venturing out in the world of intervention, but proactive intervention. We have a program going now as a research and clinical trial called the Babel Bootcamp. Laurel knows it very well. She is managing a lot of that, where we take infants at genetic risk for apraxia of speech, for instance, children who have classical lactosemia have a high risk of apraxia. We stick them into that program when they're two months old and we teach them, well, they're not babbling, we teach them to babble more, to make more noise, to be more vocal, to get those you know, consonants and those vowels out early. And that's where we want to go. We want to see if preventing this speech stuff isn't the better way to go. It's still a clinical trial. We're still waiting for the results. But if any of your listeners or watch audience have uh, families with classic lactosemia, send them to me and we'll get them enrolled. Yes, thank you. I know you talked about that at the conference last year and that is so exciting. Uh, I love that. Okay, yeah. um, you know, this has been amazing. I only have 40 minutes to record this, so I don't want to cut anyone else off. Did you guys want to leave any, um, do you have any final messages that you wanted to make sure you said? I think just in terms of being a clinical SLP, if you are out in a clinic or a school, um, I think, you know, I, I'm really excited about the possibility of using genetic knowledge for earlier intervention because, you know, that way we can hopefully, um, yeah. you know, move towards prevention or towards more accurate diagnosis. So that's kind of, I think, the end all or the end goal of, of a lot of this research is how can we use this genetic knowledge to bring it to the therapy table? Um, yes. where our kids are at, to, to bring it sooner, to bring it in a more specific and kind of focused way um, to be able to, to help clients and, and students. So. That's fantastic. 
Okay, well, thank you so much, you guys. This has been so wonderful. Really, I can't thank you enough for agreeing to this. Like I said, I think, I don't know if I said it already, but I'll just say it again. I feel like I won the lottery when I got the email from all of you that said you would agree. I just, um, my husband's like, you are such a nerd. He's like, what, what happened? What, what happened? And I was like, oh, I got these genetic researchers on a Zoom together. He was like, um, you were such a nerd. I'm disappointed you didn't have the million dollar house winning. <laughs> Uh, but we're I really thankful do for you. Yeah. We're thankful for you and, and what you do, you know, in both as an SLP and as a mom, you know, of a child with a practice. So we're really thankful <laughs> Absolutely. for you. Well yeah. said. You really do a big service to the community, Laura. I really, really appreciate you. Oh, thank you so much. Okay. All right. Well, it's been wonderful. Um, thank you so much. And um, if you have any questions, please feel free to DM me and I can reach out to these lovely individuals if I don't know the answer myself and maybe get you an answer. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye.